Okay, hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming. We're going to get started. Yeah, so um, we're going to be talking today with a special Valentine's Day edition about <laughs> healthcare apps. Um, and it's presented by Orvi, myself, Maureen. Um, and so there's no way that we can possibly talk about all the healthcare apps out there. So this is more to give you like a sense and an overview, how to find them, how to assess them, uh, what kinds of apps are out there and, and how to find the ones that are best for you. So yeah. um, we'll just, so our objectives for this session, we're going to briefly describe uh, MyNet, that's our units for core services. We're going to demonstrate how to select and identify quality healthcare apps and how to critically appraise the apps so you know which ones to try and also what you personally might want to be looking for when you try them. Um, so in terms of your own objectives for this, is there, we'd like to ask you, is there something specific that you were hoping to learn in today's lesson? Um, and to respond to that, you can just go into the chat box and we'll sort of keep an eye out there. And, and if there's a lot of people saying, oh, you know, we were hoping to hear this, we will try and, and modify our session. Yeah, to incorporate that. And we do, we have a number of polls set up and a couple of opportunities for you to give your opinions in the chat. So this is the icebreaker for you to find that on your screen and figure out where it is. And, uh, and if you've got more than one person um, that you're watching with, then you, know, you can send in a couple. Okay, we've got the okay. response there, so. um, Apps in general, okay, so. Need free apps, yeah. All right, apps that already exist for Manitoba Health. Um, is there ev an evidence base yet for apps? And so we will be certainly addressing some of this, free apps for sure, uh, evidence base for apps. Um, and developing, developing apps. apps. Okay. Which, yeah. So. Tobacco. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. So we're going to move on, but if you do have um, anything that you think about in the meantime where you think, oh gosh, I was really hoping for that, or I wish they'd talk more about that, mm -hmm. please do jump in um, to the chat box as you've just done, uh, and we're monitoring that as we go along. Yeah. Um, so in terms of who we are, so we're the MyNet librarians, um, and Ma MyNet is Manitoba's Health Information and Knowledge Network. As you can tell, there are some silent letters in that. Um, we provide services to uh, Manitoba Health, uh, fee-for-service physicians, and participating rural health authorities. Now, we know there are some people watching today that are not within our client group, and we're happy to have you for the session. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But some of the services we're talking about are not going to be available to you. Yeah. We do apologize for that, but that's that's the way it works. And we're very glad to have you. Yes, yes, we're we're happy that it's useful beyond our client base. So in terms of who we are, we've already introduced Orvi and myself. Um, we also have Gail Matheson, who is our other MyNet librarian, and Cheryl Hass, who is our library assistant. She's the person who you talk to when you are setting up a card or when you are getting document delivery or anything like that. Um, so. In terms of what we provide, we can do literature searches on any topic that you want information on um, or um, area that you're wanting more information about. We do document delivery, so articles that are behind paywalls, things like that. Never pay for them. Email us and uh, we will send them your way. It takes a little bit longer than being able to download them yourself, we know, but you don't have to pay $40 for 24 hour access or mm -hmm. whatever. So that's Excellent. Um, we also do current awareness alerts, so we can set up if you want to stay up to date on a topic, on an author, on a specific journal, um, we'll just email us, we'll set it up, and on a weekly or monthly basis, we will send you alerts about, about this, uh, whatever you've requested. And we do training, education, and orientation sessions just like this one. <laughs> um, but we can also do them on demand. Uh, we can custom build them and we can do them for groups of one pe person up to like 100 people or 200 people, um, 15 minutes, an hour, two hours, whatever length you would like. So mm -hmm. we are happy to do that. And don't be afraid to approach us about developing more sessions. Um, 
So uh, if you're a MyNet member, you will want to get a MyNet library card. That's how you get access to those services. Um, it does not give you access to the University of Manitoba Library's online collections, but again, you have accesses, access to the resources in them through us. You just can't access them yourself electronically. Um, and we will certainly do searches for you. Uh, so let's start this off with a, a poll, and we're just interested to know what kind of mobile devices you use. Uh, so if you could just respond to this poll, and we'll give it a little bit before it uh, Okay, so lots of smartphones, some tablets. Nobody's saying they don't access apps, which is nice. Um, so mostly smartphone, but about half of okay, you also uh, use a tablet, so that's good. The last few votes just coming in. Okay. Okay, so we're just gonna... Oh. Okay, so we've just got a comment in chat too about uh, we'd like to get our clients to use apps but not all have internet access. Um, if they have internet access for a limited time, a uh, number of apps will work without an internet connection, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the benefits of apps over mobile websites. Um, and this will depend on the app, how much is available offline and how much isn't. Uh, not something we have control over, <laughs> unfortunately. But. So we have a second question right away. Yeah. And so we're launching this poll. And we're just yeah, wanting to know what operating system you guys are using. Uh, OK, so we do see some BlackBerry users. Um, BlackBerry, for the most part, uh, most app developers have stopped developing apps for BlackBerry. And yeah. so we're not going to be talking about any BlackBerry apps during this, this presentation. Mm -hmm. um, iOS and Android seem to be the two most popular, um, and these are these are where the bulk of the the apps live. Though there certainly are other places where you can can get apps as well, so, uh, such as from the Google Play Store, and so on. So, okay, all right. We're just going to close that pool. Yeah, all right. So this is good. Oh, oh, sorry. We have one more. Poll. One more poll, um, and then we give you a break for a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, so, do you know how to install apps on your mobile device? Um, okay. So it's looking like most of you are are pretty confident in that, which is which is good. We have a few no's and a few not sure's. Um, so in terms of how to do it on iOS and and uh, uh, Android, you'll want to go to either the Google Play Store or the Apple Store, and you can search for or the iStore. Is that what it's called? In um, the uh, what the heck is it called? Yeah, I think it's just the App Store. Yeah. So you go in there, you do a search, you select one, you install it, and then it'll be brought up on your phone. Um, and it'll usually appear on your home screen or in one of your, your sort of secret screens. Um, we do have a comment that uh, not everybody likes when they access all your contacts, et cetera. And I agree with that, mm -hmm. but that's a decision that you have to make about the, the value of it. Now, sometimes it's, it needs access to, say, your camera because it needs to be able to take pictures or and and therefore it also needs access to your gallery so it can put the pictures somewhere. So sometimes it is, it, it's not necessarily obvious why you need them, but, and sometimes it is just data gathering and-, and Yeah, and, to... and so we definitely, that's a really great point about, you know, when you go to download an app and it asks you to log in with some kind of, like with your Facebook account mm -hmm. or your Gmail account, um, or to pull, you know, all the information from your contacts. And so you just have to think through that critically a bit. Like, do is this app important enough to me? Because usually it's either you share that information or and or you don't get the app. Like mm -hmm. it's there's yeah, usually it's no in between. Yeah. Um, and so usually you have to say, okay, I really need this app. I'll I'll share it. And in other cases, you can say I can live without playing this yeah. game or doing this or silly thing. Or you can thing. say, well, maybe there's some other 
company that creates a similar app that I can use or um, something like that. Yeah, maybe there's a similar app that yeah. would do the same features but would yeah. have better and, privacy. And who is asking for this information? Like, are you comfortable? You might be comfortable sharing this information with, I don't know, the National Library of Medicine or something, but you might not be comfortable sharing it with Joe Developer mm -hmm. um, from who knows where. So, in terms of uh, where apps come from, we sort of talked about it already, but they're available from uh, the Apple, Google Android, and Samsung Galaxy stores, the, the Google Play stores. Um, different app stores often have different versions of the same apps, but they may not be exactly the same, or they may not be released at exactly the same time. I know my main phone is an Android phone, and it often doesn't get updates on many of its apps as quickly as iPhone does, which is always a little frustrating. Um, so even though there are positive reviews of an app or something like that, it may be, um, it may be the case that even though the app is wonderful on one platform, it's not wonderful on your platform. And so that's just something to bear in mind. Okay. Um, and so in terms of some of the examples of healthcare apps, uh, as we say, there are tons of them. Um, once upon a time, you used to be able to look up health apps, and you would be able to find all of them. And this is this is no longer the case. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to talk about a couple of different types of apps. Uh, here's a word cloud of some of them. We're not going to be talking about all of them, but uh, you can see that there's medical calculators, workflows, drug calculators, point of care, etc. Um, so some of the ones that we're going to be talking about today are patient documentation apps, patient care apps, information seeking apps, which are probably ones we like, <laughs> um, professional work patterns and productivity apps, and health and wellness apps for both providers and for patients. Um, and we did have a question about how, um, how can you know which apps are safer or better to refer to clients or to know to use yourself? And that's definitely something that we're gonna be talking through as we go through these. Yeah. Um, so when you start looking for an app, you want to determine what kind of app you're looking for. Um, really, I mentioned before that you used to be able to pull up health and it would pull up all the health apps. Uh, that may not be the case here. You'll want to be sort of specific in your searching. Um, and you want to also search in the app store and read the reviews on the app store itself once you've found a couple of different options. Um, and bear in mind that the reviews may be subjective, or they will be subjective. They're, <laughs> they're, they're people's reviews. Um, but you know, if somebody gives it a one-star rating and they're like, well, I thought that this sleep tracker was going to release gas so I could fall asleep or something like that. Um, and you're like, okay, well, that's clearly not what I'm looking for and therefore that review is irrelevant. Um, that's, that's fine. Um, you want to take a look at who makes the app, if you can find that information, which can be a little difficult or, or it'll give you like a name of a company or something or the name of a person, but that's not super useful information all the time. Um, but Crack test it, which we will be talking about mm -hmm. more later, uh, but that's just basically critically appraise what you're looking at. Um, and install the ones that fit your criteria. So even though an app is wonderful, it does exactly what it needs, it might not work for you. Um, so if you try it, you don't like it, just uninstall it. It doesn't matter if it's a wonderful app. If all your friends are using it and it's not the right tool for you, then um, don't be afraid to uninstall. Yeah, so in terms of what you can do uh, when you're considering an app, you can look for app reviews outside of the store, which may be better quality, because often those are just from users of the apps and you don't know who they are, they're just other people and they, they might be professionals or they might just be your child. <laughs> um, so iMedical Apps is a review site. It's written by physicians. Um, they claim not to have any conflict of interest uh, and they provide some information on the app, screenshot examples, um, critiques, and, and price information about the apps, and some are free and some are not. Um, and then their subjective overall likes and dislikes. Um, the site does include advertising, so be aware of that if you're happen, happening to see an advertisement over and over again for an app that they've 
give it a high star rating to, we'll take that into consideration. Yeah, yeah, it may not have influenced their review, but you know, it may have. Um, and just because it's advertising on there, that doesn't mean that they're endorsing it, which is something we should probably mention. Um, the acts that we're talking about, we're not necessarily endorsing them. We're just sort of giving you an overview of, of what's going on. Um, there are also app reviews in PubMed. Uh, so you can take a look at what is out there. Um, you know, some of them are general apps for nurses. Uh, and then some of them will be reviews of individual apps and, and this sort of thing. Now, there's no, um, there's no standard search for this. You'll just want to do a, a but if you are serving, a, if you are looking for um, specific apps to refer to a specific client group, uh, we can certainly help with that. Mm -hmm. And um, we could do a literature search on it for you. We could even help to uh, make a recommendation about some of the apps to look at and use. Um, but then before you recommend them to patients, you should download them, give them a try. Um, and try them out. And, and often um, what we're seeing is when other uh, places or groups are doing that, then they're writing it up and sharing it with others so that it's not quite so redundant or you don't have to keep doing it over and over and over in every place. Uh, so we're, we're happy to help in that regard. Like today is meant to be about that real overview. Um, and just a couple of things to note in general is that any of these review sites, you want to make sure that they're reviewing the current version of the app and that really that the review isn't too out of date. Um, with PubMed in particular, it can take a while for things to get formally published. Mm -hmm. um, so you may actually find that, you know, they've got this review of this wonderful app or whatever, and by the time it's been released, the app is defunct or doesn't work the way it needed to and just be aware of that. Um, you may also want to keep an eye out for blogs you trust or, or users you trust um, and talk to them about that. And that being said, uh, we started offering uh, at the Neil John McLean Health Sciences Library here at the university, we started offering a session on apps over five years ago and we um, uh, as we recommend apps to medical students and to professors and clinicians, we found over time that some of the best apps that launched five or six years ago are still some of the best ones now. So um, it can just be one of those, like sometimes an app is really great and then it gets bought by its competitor and it's the end. And other times it's got the business case and um, the backers behind it to keep going. So, yeah. yeah. So in terms of reviewing apps, there really is no official system. So have a look at PubMed, have a look at blogs, have a look at the, the Google store, or iPhone store um, reviews and, and see what's there, make a decision based on that. Also pay attention to who created the app and who's maybe funding the app. Um, and sometimes that can be uh, related to the quality of the content in it, but sometimes it can be related to, okay, this is wonderful, but it just came out last month and it's just some guy making it. Like, what are the odds that this app is actually going to continue? Um, and also, are there conflicts of interest or, or ethical issues? If a uh, drug use app, like a drug selection app, is made by a pharmaceutical company, well, there's tremendous potential for a, a conflict of interest there. You know, are, is, is this an app that promotes their own drugs, their own tools, their own guides, or, or whatever. So be aware of that. And then, as we mentioned before, use the crap test. So what is the crap test? You want to pay attention to the currency. So how recent is the, the app, the information in the app? Is it still updated and maintained? And this is important. Is your version that you have downloaded on your phone still up to date? If you downloaded something five years ago, have you updated it since then? Because the information in it will have changed. And if it hasn't, that's also a problem. Yeah. <laughs> um, the reliability, what kind of information are they putting in there? Where are they getting that information from? Is it, what are their sources? Where, what are their methods in, in vetting this information, basically. Um, and the authority, who makes it? Um, something that's made by a, a major medical organization would be more valid than something made by me in my basement. <laughs> um, 
I don't even have a basement, yeah. but <laughs> that's besides the point. Um, and uh, and then the purpose or point of view, which we sort of covered a bit with the the why is it being made? Is it is it propaganda? Is it a sales pitch? Is it to sell you something? Is it to mine all your data information and provide you with something basic? And, and you do want to pay attention to all these things um, with healthcare apps and and with some of these things with apps in general, I suppose it doesn't matter how reliable a, a game app is. Um, and I know that some people are here uh, with questions about how to develop apps. And I think that um, if you reverse engineer some of these criteria, that can be helpful too. If you think about how are you going to promote it? Where are you going to promote it? What kinds of information are you going to make available to people who are searching for it? How are you going to support it? its continued existence? Yeah. Um, those are all important things for consideration. I'll also mention that after uh, we're done with our session today, we will be sending you a copy of the slides and also we have um, a more concrete or more explanatory handout about the crap test. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll be sharing that with you after the session. Yeah. Um, and in terms of privacy and data security, which we've already touched upon a couple mm -hmm. of times here, um, Anytime you create an account, uh, why are you sharing this information? Um, who is this information going to? Uh, is the app secure and and are they selling your information? Are they using it in, in some sort of malicious way? Um, keep an eye out for that. Yeah, thing. and if you're ever not sure, because I know sometimes you know I'll be go to download something and it'll be something that I do really want to have, mm -hmm. but then I'm really questionable as to why they want to link to my other accounts or the kinds of things just seem kind of fishy. Sometimes I will um, not use then my my good <laughs> my good accounts. I might use kind of a different account, like a different email address or something that I have, just to not be affiliated mm -hmm. um, in case there is a problem with it. Yeah, and there are certain areas where you may want to watch for this more. Um, like if you're recommending the apps to the the marginalized populations, um, be particularly aware of this. Or um, if, if it would somehow affect insurance information, like yeah. are they selling information to insurance providers? Be aware of that sort of thing mm -hmm. too. Um, so, um, and just more considerations, is the app tracking your location? Does it, Does it need, need to? to? Uh, and can you disable that feature? Often you can disable that feature, um, even if not as part of the app, as part of your, your phone's capabilities. Um, and is it linking to other accounts? And if so, is it going to post on behalf of you? And is that something you can turn off? Is it is it something that you don't care if it links? And, mm -hmm. um, and you also want to watch out for advertisements. So ads will often appear first in the App Store, and they may be what you're looking for, in which case, wonderful. But sometimes they may come up first, and you'll be like, oh, this must be the best app. But in fact, it's an ad, and it's paid to be there, and it's, it's not necessarily good. So. So just watch, and in the um, iPhone store, uh, there is, um, same as in Google results, the little uh, rounded box that says add on it. Mm -hmm. So just so that you know that somebody has paid to have that result come up. Add, promoted, anything like that. Yeah. Excuse me. Okay, so that's kind of the overview of how to think critically about these things, about how to search for them a little bit. Um, we're going to talk now about some specific categories of apps and some specific apps. So before we do that, uh, we'll make sure you're all still awake and we will, um, oh, no, this is a chat question. Oh, it's a chat question. I'm sorry. I was trying to launch a poll. Maureen um, reminded me that we'd like you to answer in your chat box, do you have a favorite health app, health, healthcare app, or even just a health app? Yeah, something that you enjoy using or that you like recommending to people or mm -hmm. or even and, the, and we're defining health very broadly here. Like we're not just talking about like strict medicine, doctors, etc. It could be like calorie trackers was one of the things listed on. Yeah. There. So okay. <laughs> Up to date. Does that count? Yes, it does. Yes, we it will does. be talking about that one. Um, oh, wow. There are a lot of ones on here that yeah. I have not heard of. There was some Mind Shift, Headspace. 
up-to-date imprivative cortex files. Fitbit. Oh, mind shift again. We better. Yeah. Um, <laughs> good thing they took a chat log. These are these are great. And what we will do is for future sessions that we're doing, um, if people have some favorite ones, we will be incorporating those for future people. Okay. Yeah, and, and again, we'll be um, sending you the slides. Uh, so we will be able to um, uh, to share with you everything that we're recommending or that we're talking about. Or that people Fantastic, mention. neat. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so really, oh, some really great um, ideas and different things. And, um, and I think we've already kind of touched on this other question, uh, which is, are you aware of any? Um, have you heard of your friends um, using different things um, and you just haven't had a chance to try them out? So if there are any like that, um, please do pop them into the chat. Mm -hmm. So there really is an app for that and for everything. So this little um, cartoon says, uh, the doctor is saying, do you want the pill, the suppository, the patch, or the app? Um, which, which really is a joke. Uh, apps aren't meant to um, replace provider uh, care. Uh, but there's a lot of really great, helpful things that they have. Um, and as Maureen mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of these apps, there's only one really that we really endorse, and the rest are a couple maybe that we endorse. The rest um, are for our presentation and for you to check out and um, take a look at on your own to decide whether you want to use them, whether you want to recommend them to your patients. Um, whether you want to develop an app that's better than them um, for your discussion. So the first kind of apps are uh, patient documentation. So these are apps that are available to work with patient uh, electronic health or medical records. And these would be something um, that would have really um, enhanced security around them to make sure that there's no breaches of privacy in sharing that patient information. And this is so different providers can access medical history, vitals, prescriptions, lab results, everything on their mobile device. And there is some really great evidence that for a number of things, um, especially for some of the diagnostic imaging, that uh, for you know for a radiologist to review some of the scans on their mobile device is just as effective as if they drove into their office and checked it on a larger computer screen. Um, so as long as those safety provisions are there to ensure that privacy uh, is still very much, privacy and confidentiality are still in place, um, then these can be really great. We're not aware of, so this is an example of one that exists, it's called Patient Keeper. Um, we're not aware of any that are currently being used here in Manitoba or in Winnipeg. If you're aware though, we'd love to hear about it. Um, and just because we're not aware doesn't mean that they don't exist or they're not being used. It just means that um, we just haven't heard about that. Mm -hmm. So these do exist. And again, I know the people in eHealth, this might be something that's really of interest or um, even teams who are working on um, patient flow or uh, any kind of flow of patients, this might be something really helpful. Uh, then there are patient and point of care apps. And again, these are things that providers can use when they're with the patients um, to help uh, provide more evidence-based healthcare. Uh, and we've got three favorite examples. Um, the first is up to date, and this, this is the one we absolutely do. Yeah, endorse. we absolutely do endorse this. Um, the province has been paying for up to date uh, on a provincial license since the beginning of January of 2016. Uh, so if you have been paying for your own version, um, stop. Don't renew that. Uh, and um, and if you're having trouble accessing the uh, versions that's paid for by the province, please contact us and we'll help you get your account um, set up. And we also have some great handouts about how to do that. So we can help you with that. Um, and this is what the app looks like. So you can access the web version and there is also the app version. And I broke it up into sort of um, screen one, two, and three. And, um, and it, up to date is basically a textbook. And it's really great for, especially if you deal with one kind of um, client group and then you have somebody else and you haven't thought about that 
subject area since med school, or you heard about rumblings that there might be some um, changes in, in policy or guidelines around that, and you're not sure if that's actually the case or what they are, this is a great little tool to bring you up to speed. And I know even as a consumer, sometimes I'll just look up, um, like I have a four-year-old that is uh, still wearing pull-ups at night. So I went to actually type in bed bugs here because that's often a topic we talk about. Um, and then I got down this huge rabbit hole about bedwetting. Um, so even as just like in my own personal life, I, up to date is really, really helpful. The another similar one, very, very similar to up to date and um, also a strong recommendation is for Dynamed, uh, Dynamed Plus. This is something you need to pay for though. So uh, if you are a member of the Canadian Medical Association, you can get it for free. And if you're not, then you could consider paying for it yourself or just use up to date. So there is some content difference between UpToDate and Dynamed. Um, UpToDate's a bit easier to use, but Dynamed does have some um, content areas that aren't included in UpToDate. So um, it might be worthwhile for you to pay for it. Maybe, maybe not. Um, and uh, with Dynamed, you can also download it so you don't have to use it online. So you can save some of your data fees if you're in an area without Wi-Fi or if you're in the bowels of a hospital or research building um, that doesn't have good access to, uh, to uh, cell signal or to Wi-Fi. Um, another one that is sort of like that kind of encyclopedia is called Medscape. Um, and this one you can, uh, similar to Dynamed, you can download it and make the content available offline. And it includes, in addition to just kind of general information about uh, medical topics, also includes information on drug interactions, um, a pill identifier, that kind of thing. Um, so it's a great little free resource. Uh, and one more is called Medibabble, and this is kind of a fun one um, that we know that some people are using as kind of a lifeline. Uh, and this is a medical translation tool for history taking. And so there, uh, and, and also once you download it, again, it doesn't need that internet connection. And, oh, I just did the one slide. But basically, if you've got someone who doesn't speak English or doesn't, um, doesn't have a, a, a robust vocabulary in English or is having trouble just thinking in English because they're sick or stressed, uh, then this can help you um, translate common history taking questions. And then it will, um, you can click on the audio button and it will say them so the uh, person that you're with can hear or they can read on your screen. So this can be a really helpful tool. Uh, drug reference is the next category. And uh, these apps um, also are really, really great. Uh, and again, so these are great if you're prescribing drugs or if you're reviewing people's charts. Um, so Hippocrates, is uh, has drug prescribing and safety information. It tells you about drug to drug interactions, helps you identify pills. So this is um, these are little tools where it'll ask you, is the pill, and then it shows you, is it round, is it oval, is it oblong, is it square, is it this shape, is it that shape? And then it'll ask you about color, and then it'll ask you about the marks that are on it and these different questions. And then it can drill down and help you identify them. So if you're with a uh, client and they've, you know, spilled their pills, or if you have somebody present to the emergency department and they've got, you know, a pocket full of pills on them and you're not sure what they are, this can be a really uh, important and helpful tool. Although Maureen and I were just playing around with it. And so she was describing a pill to me and it came up with what, 249? Oh, 800. Oh, 849 <laughs> resu possible results. So for that one, it wasn't helpful, but for others, it might be. Um, some of the content in Hippocrates you have to pay for, but some of it's free. And again, this is where it's one of those does this work for me kind of thing. Sometimes you might want to pay for it. Sometimes uh, the free version might be enough um, at your discretion. Lexicomp is also, um, it's owned by the same company as UpToDate. And there is a fair bit of duplication. Um, uh, you do get a bunch of drug information in UpToDate. Lexicomp just takes it to that next level. So we know a lot of pharmacists 
definitely need LexiComp and utilize it heavily. And a lot of physicians, they can get by with the drug information in, um, in up to date. And again, at your discretion, whether, um, whether what you need is in this, uh, you do have to pay for LexiComp. Um, so that's, you know, again, at your discretion, uh, what your threshold is for what, what, what you need and for whether the free version is going to meet your needs or whether you do need the subscriber, subscriber version. Uh, here's a little screenshot from LexiComp. Um, this is the drug reference. So this was um, an example of asking about drug interactions. And you can see on the right, it's saying uh, with the red boxes with the X in them, those ones are not safe to use together, or those ones are not safe to use together. And then the C is to take caution. So it might be things like um, only take at night because may, um, may cause drowsiness or be cautious when um, uh, don't eat grapefruits with it or whatever it might be. Uh, so it's a really helpful, really quick guide for drug interactions. And then the final one is, uh, is RXTX, which is made by the Canadian Pharmacists Association. And a few, about three years ago, they took e-therapeutics, the CPS, and a bunch of their other resources, and they packaged and branded them all together as RXTX. Um, and, and it's definitely, I mean, the Canadian Pharmacists Association is definitely a very re reliable, authoritative organization. There are currently still a bunch of questions about whether the, the full web version is included in the mobile version. And if it's not, then what exactly is and isn't the difference between them? Um, I know that RxTX is still, uh, and the Canadian Pharmacists Association are still working really hard on making sure their versions are the same. But again, this is one of those instances where there's a web version, there's a mobile version, they're not totally the same. And um, sometimes, especially when it comes to drug, it's, it's really important to know what what is and isn't included in your content. So for that reason, um, this is kind of lower on our list of, of recommendations, um, just because there's still so many questions about it. Then there are medical calculators. And, uh, and we just have one slide and we don't really have any recommendations because there are so many different types. Um, and we also know that many of you maybe aren't using medical calculators, but there are all different, there are all different kinds. And we have um, some examples here of the different ones. These just help with dosing and a lot with dosing, um, just kind of things, different calculations that you need to run on different kinds of patients. There's a med calc for that. Um, so we're also going to now talk about uh, information seeking apps. Um, if any of you attended our Keeping Current session, which we did previously, some of this will be familiar to you. Um, so in terms of part of information seeking is keeping current. How do you stay up to date on what's happening in your field, um, in the journals that you care about? Uh, we're going to talk quickly about two apps, Browsing and QXMD, uh, both of which are apps that you can link to a library, um, but unless you have a nil appointment here or otherwise affiliated with the university, you wouldn't want to do that. Um, and you can still use them even without the, the Set up. So in terms of what they do, they're, they're kind of similar. They've both got a desktop and, uh, and an app version. Um, they both require registration. Browsing is sort of all e-journals. Uh, QXMD is really only medical journals. Um, you can't annotate PDFs in browsing. You can in, in QXMD. Um, just their, their visual layout is a little bit different. We'll go through each of them, so I won't get into it here. Um, and uh, you know you can get alerts, you can get uh, notifications in your uh, email for QXMD. Um, and so this is what browsing looks like. You can see it's sort of set up like a shelf here in, in this example. We only have one shelf and it's only got two items on it, but you can fill it up and you can sort the, the shelf according to subject area or something like that. So if you if you need one thing on mental health care and one thing on so one shelf on mental health care, one shelf on rheumatoid arthritis, yeah. and one shelf on uh, health care apps. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, now, browsing, if you don't have a library that you're connected to, it will only show open access journals. So your favorite journal may not be accessible through it. And, and this is one of those instances where if you're interested and you think it might be useful, give it a try. Mm -hmm. And if it turns out that your favorite journal isn't in there, just delete the app and don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, or find a different way to get the content from your favorite journal. Uh, but if your favorite journal is in there, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And if you do want more ways to, to do that, our Keeping Current uh, session is still up on the MyNet website. So you can, if you need more information about that uh, alternative means of staying up to date, you can do that. Or even more information on these two apps, uh, you can watch that. Um, QXMD, uh, same thing. You can't link it up to the University of Manitoba's collection unless you have your own account here. Uh, so you'll just want to leave your, your institution field blank. You can see that this one is structured a bit more text-based. So, so maybe you prefer this because it's more text-based. Maybe you like the other one because you like looking at, at visual mm -hmm. things. Um, and that's, that's a very subjective difference, but it can be an important difference for you. Um, so in terms of what happens when you say, oh, that article looks really nice, but it turns out you don't have access to that article. Um, you can, don't, don't pay money to get access, send us an email and we will send the article yeah. to you. Um, and there are other ways that you can get information. So I'm sure people have heard about TED Talks where there's just ideas being presented all on all sorts of topics, not just medical topics. Um, and TED Talks has an app as well, um, so you can get that on your phone and pay attention to that. Um, we also have productivity apps. So in terms of some, some popular productivity apps, there's Dropbox, which allows you to, to share documents and to sync them. And to, if, you, if you're working from different locations, both of these are are quite excellent apps. Uh, Orvi uses Dropbox more, and I use Google Drive more, uh, where you can work on files simu simultaneously with a, a colleague, where you can, um, you know, the, the information is shared in the cloud instead of being bound to a specific item. Now, we do know that these don't work at, for example, Manitoba Health, where there's big, heavy firewalls. Mm -hmm. So it may be the case that it doesn't work at your institution either if you're not at Manitoba Health. And yeah, but um, I mean, just to drill into these a little bit, um, I love Dropbox because like Maureen says, I uh, take my laptop around with me. I work in different locations a lot. I also sometimes work offline. Um, and then once I come online, then I like it to sync. Um, and uh, so I love Dropbox for that reason, that no matter where I am, um, that if somebody says, oh, about that thing that you worked on four months ago, can you just pull that up again? I don't have to wait until I'm back at a certain location and have connected to a certain um, uh, uh, intranet. I can just keep everything in my Dropbox. Whereas Google Drive, we know a lot of people love it for when they're working on different mm -hmm. collaborative projects, yeah. especially students or especially people working on documents because you yeah. can work on it simultaneously. So Maureen can be at like, her location at- You can be writing a paper together. You can chat in the sidebar about what you're doing, about why you're making these changes. Your text will show up in different colors. Yeah. Um, it's, it's also, again, they're all beneficial for, you can work offline with Google Drive too and then it'll sync when you when you turn back on. Yeah, um, and then the apps are really helpful. Not as much, like I would never work on a document front, or I would rarely work on a document, you know, like a writing a paper um, when on my Google Drive on my phone, but sometimes I've it's- done it on my tablet, it's not wonderful, it's but not you can wonderful. do it. Like, especially if you need to have it done right at that moment, it's handy to have it. And it's also just handy to um, pull up the, that reference, so it might be, what did, like, what was that section called or what was that reference or just kind of that quick reference uh, that can be really, really helpful. Now we do have a question in here about how secure is something like Dropbox um, and then a question, was it iCloud that was attacked a couple of years ago? I think that both Dropbox and iCloud have been attacked at different times. Yeah. And unfortunately, most of these major things are going to probably suffer DDoS attacks at some point. Um, 
And, and there are other things to consider, like security is sort of variable, right? Like both of these have their servers hosted in the United States. So if you're dealing with confidential patient information, it may not be okay for you to be using these sources. You may need to use something where the servers are in Canada and where you have uh, specific special encryption set up. Um, and this is part of the reason why at Manitoba Health, they're not mm -hmm. allowed at all is, you know, um, you know, budget documents for the province can't be shared on these. Um, uh, or any, um, I know even here at the university for research ethics, you can't use um, these kinds of things because of that variability. Mm -hmm. So again, at your discretion. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're sharing recipes or sharing, you know, pictures maybe with some family members, uh, go for it. Yeah. But one of the things to also consider is, is in terms of the security of it, if you're comparing it to your home computer, for example, it might be more secure. Um, or like if, if your home computer is being used by multiple people or if it's being used by somebody who's just like, oh, I like this, this thing from this Nigerian prince telling me to. Yeah. Um, so you, you do sort of have to look at that in a, in a broader. In a broader sense, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so they're secure-ish yeah. is, is the sort of answer that we can give there. Um, there are also some note-taking uh, productivity tools. Um, there's one called Evernote, which kind of keeps, again, it keeps things in the cloud and it allows you to bring in all sorts of media. So it's not just documents. So you can um, have audio or video or, and you can access it from all your devices. So I believe you can only use two devices with the free version and then mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's more, you, you pay a monthly subscription. Um, and uh, it'll put things into notebooks for you, but you can also tag them. So if this largely belongs in project A, but it's also related to project B, you can tag it with something that's useful for project B. Um, and then there's something called Penultimate, which is a handwriting app, and it, it syncs up with Evernote, so you can keep these together. Um, so if you're somebody who likes to, to take physical notes with a pen, um, but you don't want to always be carrying around a notebook or you want to have a way to, to find that information without carrying around the notebook. Something like this can be super helpful if you're into sketch noting or anything else. Um, yeah, great tool. Yeah. Um, and one we learned about more recently that some people, mm -hmm. again, at Manitoba Health are using, it's very, very similar to Evernote, is uh, Microsoft's OneNote. So if you at work use the Microsoft products, um, OneNote quite likely is included here. And this is the same kind of thing. It kind of replaces your notebook. So then if you forgot your notebook, you know, this is always with you on your device. Um, and you can, you can see in this example, um, they've got all kinds of different little notes here. So they've got recipes, uh, notes about books. They've got a to-do list, just kind of general notes. Um, you can, you know, this is your notebook. Uh, and so, and again, it um, syncs to your, to all your devices. Um, and do we want to deal with these questions that we have here? They're okay. Okay. Um, and so uh, another one is Wonderlist, uh, which I know Orvi uses extensively, um, which is basically like a fancy to-do list that yeah. you can sort into different things, but I mean, you I still have stick as Maureen's witnessing in my office. I still have sticky notes all over the place. Yes, you can't see them, but there's one, two, three, yeah. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh gosh, that's okay. Well, when you can look them, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> Eleven, twelve. Yeah. So they. Oh, <laughs> I thought I was doing so well. Um, so yeah, you, I use Wonderlist for my grocery list. I use it to remind me about books that I found interesting, movies that I want to watch. I also, you know, when I'm on the way home and I thought, oh gosh, I forgot to do these five things at work and I need to remember to do them, then I can just jot them down. So again, it's that when you've only got your phone with you and you need to remember something for another time, um, this is a really great tool. And again, there's a web version as well. So when you're working, you can just, again, run your to-do lists. Um, it's a great little tool. Um, okay, so we have a question in here. Is it safer to use a website versus an app? And this is going to depend mm -hmm. in, in each situation. Um, so there's an ex they've, they've asked, for example, for banking. Um, and this will depend who's, who's creating the, 
the app. If it's your bank creating the app, it's probably about as good as the website. Um, you can use one or the other. The bank might even have a recommendation. If you're using, if it's if it's a third, a lot of apps are made by third parties. Um, they will almost certainly be less secure than anything that yeah. is uh, that is made by the the company that puts something out. Um, but this is really a case by case basis. Yeah, exactly. Um, though in general, as, as a general rule, if something is free, it is probably free because it is getting something from you. So it's probably not going to be the most secure in, in some cases. And that's not always the case. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes there's um, big, you know, big government, um, you know, if Health Canada put out an app mm -hmm. that was free, there they would have the incentive to make it free so that um, every, it was accessible yeah. to all people. Whereas if hey, make your payments through us, mm -hmm. We're, we'll let you make that payment for free, um, that would be more suspect. Yeah. yeah, and so this would be one of those areas where you, if you're concerned about the security, absolutely check reviews. And check reviews not just if it's a medical app, not just from, from medical providers, but from uh, people who are in the know about technology as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, we have, I think, our last topic area as we draw to a close on our hour-long session, are about specialty healthcare apps. Now, this is um, like in the last, when I mentioned that five years ago, when apps started to be a thing that people were able to utilize in the healthcare they were providing and in, in the care that they were recommending um, uh, for ways for people to get information, these have really exploded. There are all kinds. Um, so, you know, some examples, uh, the Canadian Red Cross, they basically took their first aid manual, they've made it an app, because when you're in a car accident or you come across a car accident, maybe you have a copy of the first aid manual in your car, but many people don't, but chances that you have your phone are really high. Um, and Alberta has an emergency alert. Now, mixed reviews on this one. Um, again, this might be something that uh, people here in the province might want to take a look at in that, uh, you know, just with BC with their, um, with the tsunami, it was a tsunami, right? Yeah. With the yeah, tsunami the warning, um, they, they were pleased with some aspects of how their emergency alert was working and other areas uh, they've found that there's some weaknesses and some definite places to improve on. So that might be something. Um, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, they've got all kinds of things. We just learned about one earlier today um, about vaccines. And this was a mom saying, oh yeah, I've got this. And for my three kids, it's got their, when they've had their vaccines, it reminds her when she needs to have the next ones. And then if she's ever in a situation and somebody says, when was the last time that your child had this vaccination or did they receive that one? Then she can actually authoritatively remember. So again, when you go to the app store, if you've identified a need of something like, hey, I wish that I could have a reminder about this or a place to record that, go to the app store and check it out because there's gonna be an app for that. <laughs> oh, somebody says they have that. What, where's my note about what that's called? Somebody said they had the vaccine app as well. So. Oh, it's <laughs> called Can Immunize, like can Canadian immunization, or at least that's the one that she, um, refers to so I'm definitely uh, on my way home today downloading that app and finding all my bits of <laughs> my sticky notes about about our family's immunizations. So again, tons of specialty health healthcare apps. Some of these I just want to download because they find so fascinating. How can there be a whole app about diagnosing gout? I don't know, but I'm really excited to find out. There's also a um, quick anesthesia gas guide. Frankly, it seems a bit alarming that you can just have an app to tell you how to administer gas into a person. But um, again, I, I say that a little bit jokingly, but this is just like a good training tool for people. You can do exam flashcards, medical um, dictionaries, scheduling and communication for nurses or different people, healthcare workers um, that are switching shifts or that wanna see schedules and access schedules all kinds of stuff. And then of course, mental health. We That was some of the recommendations that um, at people here provided. Uh, we'll be building your recommendations into our slides, um, but there's all kinds of ones on self-care. There are some on suicide prevention. I know we've got mm -hmm. some people at Manitoba Health that are really interested in the safety aspects of those, uh, the content of those. There's apps on cognitive behavioral therapy, like 
so many. It's so exciting. <laughs> and and ones that are for providers and ones that are for patients. For patients, yeah. So um, uninstall all those apps that you don't use so that you've got room to try out all these new ones. Um, and then there's specialty healthcare apps for patients. So there's ones to help you quit smoking. For diabetics, there's sugar trackers. Um, there's pregnancy trackers. And for babies, you can track their feeding, sleep, di uh, and diaper trackers. And again, you can sync them so that multiple people in the family can know about these things. Um, you can monitor cardiac performance from home. So cardiac patients that go home from the hospital after a heart attack, they can just upload their data and then their cardiologist or their family physician can see that. Um, there's speech pathology apps, like, and on and on and on. Um, and then there's just the general health and wellness ones. So uh, when we presented this session um, at Manitoba Health, we asked people like, what are you guys using? And they were a little bit hesitant at first, and then the different ones kind of started coming out. So one person had like, she, I think she was like downloading 25 a day. She was so, she was almost an addict to these different things, but they're neat, right? And I know that the evidence on some of the ones about like how many steps you've taken today or different activities, maybe they're not translating into substantial weight not loss or more improved health benefits. But we definitely know that people um, are incented to use them and that they're definitely making some smarter, healthier choices. Um, yeah, and you can do that whether you're trying to lose some weight or get to bed on time or whether you're training for a marathon. Yeah. All kinds of stuff. Or if you need to keep track of, of your, you know, what pills you're taking and that sort of thing. Oh, so, that's right. Yeah. yeah, we had another great recommendation about, you know, somebody that they had the alarm set on their phone to remind them to take their um, their pill. And then a week later, they thought, oh, gosh, I accidentally shut off that alarm. And I don't think I've taken my pill in the last week, but I don't totally remember. Um, these are all really great. So to finish us off. Uh, we'll do our last, um, we'll do one, we, I think we have two more quick polls here. We'll just ask you whether you know how to uninstall apps for your mobile device. We've been talking about it a little bit and we'll just ask, so most people know yet, say yes. Some people are saying they're not totally sure or so, no, but we definitely recommend that you um, learn how to do this or make sure you know how to do this. Yeah. Usually what you'll want to do is when you go into your, your, not necessarily your home screen, but like your, the screen where the apps are actually held. You your main page, to, yeah. Your main page, you just want to press and hold and you will see an uninstall button. And it's important that you're looking for the uninstall button, especially on Android, instead of the remove from home screen. Mm. So, and on iPhone, you just, it's just the, the X. Yeah. Yeah. But usually it's press and hold and then some sort of removing option will come up and mm -hmm. then, and then you can remove. So hopefully you'll take that away as a good takeaway, which is your phone will run faster um, because you, all the junk on there is not on there anymore and you'll have more room available for memory and for new, uh, new apps. Yes. And if you're not sure, it's always a good idea to look it up on Google because there will be guides for how to do it that are probably more descriptive than my like, <laughs> that I just told you about. Or so. often, or often it's ask your kids. Yeah. <laughs> they often, they often know or your colleagues. So a review, again, we'll be sending you the slides and, um, and our handout from today's takeaways. But when you go to look for an app, determine what you're looking for. Are you looking for emergency preparedness? Are you looking for mental health? Are you looking for a step tracker? What are you looking for a gout diagnosis? Um, I know what I am. And uh, what are you looking for? Search for that in the, in the app store. Read reviews, read reviews, read reviews, critically appraise, critically appraise, critically appraise. Uh, install the ones that fit your criteria. Give it a try. And if it's not for you, just uninstall it. And if it stops working the way you want it to, you can uninstall it. Yeah. Keep that in mind. And keep it up to date. Yes. Yeah. Um, especially if you're concerned about security. Keep your apps up to date. Yeah. Um, so we are out of time and we will be sending you a survey and so we are very interested to know um, what if you learn if you learned today if you learned anything and if you did what did you learn um, and what apps will you try so if you have questions we'll be online for a bit 
and uh, we'll be following up with you with our handouts and with our little survey. And we thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, that's it from us. All right, but we will stay here. We will probably mute ourselves unless there are any questions. Um,